Good morning, everyone. Welcome to SQP TV. Today we have a distinguished guest, uh, Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy, with us. Welcome to SQP TV, uh, Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy. How are you today? I'm good. Uh, good morning, Srinivas. Good morning, sir. Thank you. So we would like to know a little bit more about you. I know we've been talking to each other. I mean, just about for the sake of audience, I would really appreciate if you can tell us a brief uh, uh, bio of yourself. I mean, how you started your business and then got into the politics. I really appreciate if you can give us some uh, information about yourself, please. Sure. Um, well, uh, first, it's nice to be with you. I'm uh, Raja Krishnamurthy. I was born in India. And I came to this country when I was three months old. Uh, my, my father was studying uh, engineering at uh, uh, State University of New York, Buffalo. So we started off in Buffalo. And um, from there, uh, moved to Peoria, Illinois, uh, where my father took up a job teaching engineering at Bradley University. Uh, he just concluded his 40th year, and he's retiring. Um, but from there, I went to... Uh, uh, Princeton University for uh, mechanical engineering and then Harvard Law School and then I came back to Illinois and practiced law. Um, I helped to start the anti-corruption unit for the Illinois Attorney General's office. Uh, business was good unfortunately because uh, there's a lot of cor corruption in Illinois at the time. And then uh, went back to the private sector and ran a small business. And I did that for about seven years and then got elected to this position in 2016, and I've been serving ever since in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, as part of this position. Very nice to hear your uh, story. And uh, uh, I mean, you're representing, I mean, District 8, uh, the Illinois, uh, the Congressional District 8 in, from Illinois. So we would like to know, I mean, what uh, what have you done so far? I mean, uh, for the uh, district eight or in general in the Congress, I would really appreciate if you can let us know uh, your achievements or your accomplishments uh, during this last uh, uh, close to four years of uh, uh, your tenure or term at the in the Congress. Well, um, I think you could probably put it into uh, two buckets. One is um, in terms of legislation, what we've accomplished, and there, um, you know, I'm very proud of our efforts with regard to um, uh, strengthening vocational education and post-secondary opportunities for people not going to four-year college. And then secondly, um, conducting oversight of the administration. And there we um, uh, got a lot done with regard to the pandemic and just making sure that um, you know, w uh, money is spent properly by the government um, uh, and, and basically making sure that the Trump administration uh, conducts, conducts its affairs efficiently and uh, free of waste, fraud and abuse. Gotcha. That's uh, fair enough. I mean, uh, we would like to uh, know a little more about, I mean, uh, you mentioned the COVID-19 and the spending and all this things. So during this time, I know there are many other areas got affected, especially healthcare and the small business. Yes. You being a, a small business owner in the past and then, and also working on skill development for the young people. I mean, there's another law legislation you, you have proposed and you got it passed I mean, in your first term. So uh, I would like to understand, I mean, what is that, I mean, Congress is planning for the small business. I know they have given the PPP, uh, um, no doubt, I mean, but it is, I mean, not everybody is getting, uh, not uh, not that deserved, I mean, the people who actually need it, not getting it, I mean, people who are already rich, some of them are in cashing it. So what is what are your thoughts and what are your uh, proposals will be for the small business? In spite of the PPP, I'm sure there will be some need for the small business. It's, it's going to be a tough or a uh, uphill road for the uh, small business to recover even after the uh, we find the solution and come back to normal. Come back to normal will be a tough for the small businesses. So what are the things which Congress as a, as a team is proposing to recover the small businesses in the U.S.? Well, you know, I was a former small business person, so this is uh, very important for me that our small businesses are rejuvenated and are kept alive um, during this pandemic. Um, and so I'm glad that my office played a, a important role in helping establish the 
pay, payroll protection program, PPP, but more needs to be done. Um, I can think of two things that we still need to do to help small businesses. One, make it very simple to have these loans forgiven. Um, as you know, uh, sometimes uh, you know red tape and the bureaucracy can prevent um, you know a program from operating in the way that it's intended. And here, uh, with regard to loan forgiveness, if we have too much paperwork and red tape, um, there could be uh, some businesses that aren't able to have their loans forgiven or forgiven in time for them to really realize the benefit. The second issue is I still think that we need more assistance for businesses, especially in industries that are very hard hit right now. Um, just as an example, um, the hospitality, tourism, airline, restaurant industries, and others um, are, are facing tremendously uh, difficult times because uh, of the nature of the pandemic. In the absence of a vaccine, people are not willing to congregate or get together, and that really interferes with their business. Gotcha. That's, uh, uh, and another, when you come to the, I mean, passing the bills and the uh, working in the Congress, um, I mean, earlier, I mean, at least few years, I would say uh, 10 or 15 years back, I mean, we see uh, uh, with the Republican or Democrat, I mean, as long as it is useful to the people, I mean, people used to uh, talk to each other and then uh, come to a solution. But today's situation, what we see is, I mean, okay, it is a Democratic bill. So how do I stop it rather than working on it? If it's a Republican bill, I mean, I mean, Democrats think that how do we, uh, do we get any brownie points on that? Or do we get, I mean, uh, are the brownie points going to the uh, Republicans? So, so this kind of environment, I mean, is uh, uh, not good for the American people. So what do you think, I mean, of this current situation? And do you think this is going to be uh, change into the good for the good, I mean, for the good causes in the future? Or do you think it will be the divided the way it is right now, uh, uh, forever. I think it depends on the tone that's set at the top. Um, you know, when you have a president that divides people constantly, um, it's very difficult to bring people together. And therefore, I think that it really is important that um, the president, but also each of us as individuals, do everything we can to bring people together, to unite us, um, and to avoid, you know, becoming um, divided along uh, racial, ethnic, partisan, or other lines. Um, at the end of the day, what we share in common far exceeds what separates us. And we have to remember that as we confront our common challenges right now. For instance, the pandemic and the coronavirus doesn't know any party labels. Um, it attacks everybody equally, regardless of party, regardless of income, regardless of geography. And so we have to come together and unite to defeat this virus. From the virus point of view, this is a good thing. I mean, so do you, uh, from, I mean, the same time, I mean, we have during this COVID-19 time, we have another social issue, which has I mean, started in Minneapolis and then spread all over the country. And it has, uh, it's been going on in multiple cities, especially the Black Lives Matter. So, so what Black Lives Matter and uh, along with the Black Lives Matter, I mean, no doubt, I mean, we all know that the Black Lives Matter uh, for sure. And at the same time, I mean, along with the Black Lives Matter movement, we are getting the riot, uh, seeing the riots in some places. So how do you see the Black Lives Matter movement along with the riots uh, coming along with the uh, movement? Sorry. I believe that um, there's no place for violence. Um, violence of any kind, whether it's directed at an individual, as we saw with the murder of George Floyd, or any, any individual in police custody, or violence against property, or looting, or rioting, or um, vandalism, I think is unjustified. I think that um, Americans want a 
situation where we are lowering the temperatures and lowering tensions, not raising them. Um, and so um, I really believe that people should have the opportunity to peacefully um, express themselves and protest. Um, but at the same time, uh, we have to do everything we can to uh, prevent looting or rioting or any kind of violence because it really does grave damage uh, to our body politic and our ability to resolve our differences peacefully. Got it. Very nice. So uh, the same thing movement has also brought in another uh, topic of uh, uh, police uh, reforms. I mean, reforms in the police department. I mean, uh, we see that, I mean, uh, you know, there are many good police officers who have helped, I mean, uh, community members, so no doubt about it. I mean, whether it be kids or whether it be seniors or whether it be uh, youngsters, I mean, we all respect and uh, their uh, service to the nation for sure. But it's saying there are few people, I mean, they will be there in every community. I mean, they, they get some, they do some bad things and they create the bad marks to the complete community. So to avoid those kind of situations, I mean, do we see that, I mean, the police reforms are needed or what, what, do you, what is your opinion on that? I mean, we respect for sure all the police officers who are servicing our, serving our community, but at the same time, do we see an, a need for accountability too? You know, recently, Srinivas, there was a study by the newspaper USA Today looking at police records, and they found that 10% of police account for the vast, vast majority of um, allegations and instances of police misconduct, meaning 90% of police officers have nothing to do with it. So the vast, vast majority of police officers do a good job and try to uphold their oath to really serve and protect the community. However, with regard to those 10% of police officers, some of them account for hundreds of allegations and instances of misconduct. And so what we want to do is, on the one hand, reward and uphold those police officers who are doing a good job every day. And you and I know who those people are. And on the other hand, create a culture where those bad cops or bad police officers are um, uh, held to account, are ostracized and removed from the police force if they persist in their misconduct. You know, one of the sad things that's happening in a lot of communities, including uh, inner city Chicago, is that many crimes go unsolved because the community doesn't trust the police. Um, and when you have crimes go unsolved, basically what happens is that the perpetrators get away literally with murder. And when you have the perpetrators getting away with murder and robbery and looting or shooting, uh, they will do it again and again and again. And so we have to get them off the streets. But that starts with building trust between the police and the community. And so I'm doing everything I can to uh, further enhance that trust. Thankfully, in my district, um, most of the police um, are very, very uh, good people, and they have developed very strong bonds with the community. So I'm glad about that. It's very nice to hear about the story about your uh, the relationship with the police officers within our community. It's just nice to hear that. And I'm sure, I mean, many communities will be building those kind of relationship with the police officers across the country. Uh, coming back to another topic, I mean, uh, the COVID-19 has uh, exposed the weaknesses in our uh, healthcare system. And, uh, and especially during the uh, tough economic situations, I mean, not everybody will be able to afford to have a health care, I mean, uh, health insurance. So with, which is going to be a ch uh, challenge for many people to have health insurance and have the health services available for them. So do you, I mean, uh, the Democratic Party, some portions, uh, some part of the Democratic Party, they are proposing a single payer healthcare system. So what is your view? on single-payer healthcare, if they want to propose, do you support it or, or, or what, what do you, if not, I mean, what are the other solutions would you like to uh, provide for the uh, US citizens on the healthcare side, on the healthcare front, please? Well, I very much believe in universal access to healthcare. So I believe every American should have access to high quality healthcare coverage uh, as well as healthcare. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't 
yet attained that particular goal. Um, I believe that some 10 to 15 percent of Americans still don't have that type of access. And so um, what I believe is that we should continue to expand, um, for instance, uh, programs such as Obamacare, which I think is a very good program if it's done properly. Unfortunately, the current administration has repeatedly uh, attempted to repeal it, even in the even during a pandemic when people are um, relying on it so heavily. Um, but as you know, hundreds of millions of Americans have benefited from Obamacare because of its um, various protections, including for people with pre-existing conditions. Um, I believe that we have to continue down the road of strengthening Obamacare. I would also look at adding a public option to the exchanges, meaning that um, more affordable options should be there, especially in situations where there's just not a lot of competition on the exchanges. And if you add a public option, it helps to um, give further price competition to those private health insurance options that the rest of us enjoy. I happen to be on Obamacare myself. And so I have a uh, personal interest in making sure that the five people in my family, my wife and three kids, um, have a strong Obamacare system. Uh, and I want everyone else to have um, strong options as well. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and coming another topic, uh, I would like to switch to another topic. Like education is another one which is very important. I mean, basically, especially the minorities. I mean, uh, let it be African Americans or Hispanic. I mean, uh, where uh, they are, uh, we in statistics say that I mean they are below poverty. Some of them are below poverty lines. So usually, the education is the one which will bring people uh, from the uh, lift them from the poverty and then uh, enrich them with all, in all aspects. So, but I mean, in America, I mean, we see that I mean, education system K-12 is uh, fairly, I mean, uh, deteriorating rather than progressing uh, year after year. So as a congressman and as a congress, I mean, what is that, I mean, uh, you or your team is proposing to help improve the education system in the U.S.? We are not in the top but uh, top five in, in the world. I mean, we are somewhere down, uh, not, not, at least for sure, not in the top five in the, in the world. Well, this is an ongoing challenge. And I believe that um, as Indian Americans, and uh, in my case, I'm an immigrant, um, for me and my family, public education really was the gateway to the American dream. And so what I believe very strongly is that we, strengthen the public education system, okay? And what that means is, um, you know, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of zip codes in the United States, you know, property taxes um, are not sufficient to provide a um, high enough standard uh, for public education for our children. And so that's where state and federal supplements are appropriate in addition to the property taxes generated by the businesses and the residences in that area. So that's one big issue that we have to tackle, which is funding for public schools. Um, the second issue that I think we have to tackle is making sure that we constantly are attracting the highest quality teachers, the highest caliber teachers into our public schools and the teaching profession. It's a very challenging profession to say the least and unfortunately, I am always um, uh, very concerned that some of our best and brightest uh, don't go into teaching because it doesn't pay enough or they are burdened by high student debt coming out of college. So we have to create incentive programs in that regard to get the highest caliber students into teaching and into our public schools. And then third and finally, we have to help parents. Um, you know, many of our parents are working. Uh, they are working, um, in many cases, both of the spouses are working. And because of that, they are under extreme stress, <laughs> uh, not just with their jobs, but then when they come home taking care of their children and um, uh, also the financial pressures uh, associated with taking care of their children. 
And in that regard, I think that we have to help them. So for instance, we have to provide childcare assistance for them um, in, the, in the form of uh, economic assistance to make it more affordable for them to take care of their children at home um, and to use those additional monies uh, to uh, going to uh, tutoring and other educational supplements that child care that we assist them with should be educationally nutritious, so to speak. So it's not just putting people in front of Dora the Explorer on uh, TV, but actually having them learn even at the same time that uh, their children are being taken care of. So those are just a, a few of the issues that I see. Gotcha. Well, hopefully, I mean, things will, uh, new uh, laws will come in, uh, new policies will come in, and the education system will uh, improve, and that will be helpful for the most of the uh, underprivileged people and also the regular common people, too. Yes. So, coming back to, yeah. Uh, recently, I mean, coming back to the politics, I mean, the uh, presidential politics right now, I mean, I know uh, it is uh, very hot uh, right now. It's less than two months, uh, looks like. I mean, so, I mean, recently you have written a letter, I mean, along with the uh, Congresswoman uh, Katie Potter from California, I think you were raised a uh, doubt on uh, uh, post office general uh, Louis DeJoy. So what is that, I mean, you question and w what kind of answers did you guys get it, I mean, from the department, I mean, which, uh, to which you sent a letter? Well, the big issue right now is that the post office is in disarray. Um, this is very concerning because you don't want mail to be delayed, especially in a pandemic and especially in an election year when so many people will be mailing in their ballots and so much election material mail will be in transit going back and forth between residences and uh, election authorities and so forth. And so um, I have some severe uh, criticisms of Mr. DeJoy, who decided to embark on operational, ch he's the postmaster general for the USPS, the US Postal Service. He decided to embark on significant operational changes, which delayed the mail. And um, doing so at this time is a horrible decision. And given his own personal conflicts of interest um, and other um, allegations swir swirling around him and controversies swirling around him, um, I just don't think that he's the right leadership that we need right now. Now. Um, at a crucial time, uh, you know, during an election year. Gotcha. Oh, we, uh, we, uh, and, I, we, uh, and another thing is recently you won, I mean, uh, a nomination from your party to run for the eighth uh, district, congressional district. And um, congratulations on that. Thank you. Uh, and so, what is that you would like to tell? I mean, your achievements uh, in, in your two terms. And what are you trying to do for your uh, constituents? So what do you like to say to your constituents on this? Well, I think that um, what I'd like to say to them is thank you. Uh, thank you for the honor of representing you uh, in the United States Congress. Um, it's the honor of my lifetime. Um, I am here to help you. And we have um, fortunately had the benefit of helping thousands and thousands of our constituents through a very, very challenging time in our history. Um, and when I go to Washington, I think about you every day and how to uplift your family economically. I think that is the number one issue that each of us faces, which is how to make sure that your family is safe from a health standpoint, but also how to get your family and your business up the up escalator of the economy and to make sure everyone has access to that up escalator, regardless of who you are or where you come from, or regardless of the number of letters in your name. There are 29 in mine, Srinivas. And so that's why it's so important that we um, continue with our program of economic uplift, and that is what I will focus on going forward. Very nice. And, uh yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, we need a lot of uh, economic reforms. I mean, which needed for the uh, to develop the I mean, the economy at the jobs. I mean, improving the jobs or like improving the business environment. Hopefully, these things will work. 
uh, come back to normal way at the earliest possible. And uh, so coming back to the uh, climate change, and there are you've been, I think you've uh, written, I mean, few uh, proposed few things on the climate change. Uh, so can you, I mean, is it, I mean, uh, f before we go to that one, I mean, do you think we need to go back to the Paris uh, uh, tree, I mean, uh, uh, WTOs, I mean, uh, they, uh, 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 to go back and uh, America should go back and join the Paris Treaty or do we need to uh, stay back, stay out of that one? Sorry. No, I absolutely think we have to rejoin the uh, Paris Climate Accord because as you know, um, Environmental change is not done in a vacuum. It's done uh, in partnership with countries around the world. Um, weather and climate um, have no geographic boundaries. And therefore, uh, we have to make sure that we, along with our partners around the world, uh, combat this issue of CO2, excess CO2 and carbon dioxide in our atmosphere and really um, make sure that we don't get to a situation where the changes to our climate are irreversible in the wrong direction. And so that's what I hope we will do. And I think we will do that um, hopefully with the new president. Okay, let's hope for that. I mean, you brought in another good uh, point. I mean, uh, uh, the Joe Biden and the Kamala Harris uh, ticket. So. I know the, the, the exciting part is, I mean, okay, at least Kamala Harris is from, I mean, her origins are from India. Uh, so what are your thoughts and uh, views on that ticket? And uh, what, what do you see? I know you're Democrats, so I'm sure I can understand your stand on that particular point, but I just I would like to hear from you, your views on that. Well, I think that, for instance, uh, you know, Kamala Harris, um, uh, I think she's a fabulous pick. Um, I think that not only is she uh, tough and ready to be vice president and president if the need be, um, but like you said, part of her roots are in India. And if you look at pictures of her family, it looks like your family or my family. And I think that that uh, gives everybody some um, uh, joy. Um, I think that the moment that she's sworn in as vice president of the United States, Indian American boys and girls will wake up to a new reality where um, they too could potentially be vice president or president of the United States. And that always is a good thing when we make progress as a society. And um, I, of course, I think Joe Biden is an excellent uh, nominee to be president. And I think he will be the next president. I th thank you very much for uh, for your views and uh, thoughts on that particular thing. And, uh, and one last point, I mean, especially the immigration and in the in, in the uh, in the immigration, especially the focus on the, uh, the student visas and the H one Bs. So what I mean, most of the students from India or even other countries too. But I mean, true because of the community we are in. I mean, I'm talking about the students from India have suffered a lot. So what do you see? I mean. Uh, the uh, status of uh, F1 and uh, H visas in the future? Um, I think the future is bright, um, provided that we have a change in leadership. Um, and I think that um, with a new president, we will have a comprehensive immigration uh, law. And part of that comprehensive immigration law will be, um, you know, for instance, reforms that help people on uh, H-1B, such as removing the per country quota, which I have been strongly supportive of, um, as well as uh, just making it easier for high skilled people who immigrate here to join the club, so to speak, to become green card holders and citizens so that they can unleash their full potential and help to uh, unleash America's full potential economically as well. Uh, thank you very much for your views and thoughts. Thank That's any final words for the audience. I just want to say thank you and remember to vote uh, on November 3rd uh, is the most important election of our lifetime. And uh, please do everything you can to register now and then uh, safely vote either by mail or early or, early or in person on election day. But you must vote. That's in incredibly important. 
Thank you very much, uh, Congressman Raja Krishnamurthy, for coming on the show. And we, we wish you all the best in your future endeavors and your election. Too. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Srinivas. Thank, Thank you, sir. Have a nice day. Thank you.